Hi, this is John Harcher, and welcome to the real episode two of Valleys of Numenor. We'll be taking a look at the second episode of The Rings of Power and see where the story goes from here. We'll also see if we meet any new characters or any familiar faces. Let's go. Episode two, the one after the premiere. After a quick recap of the last episode, we get what we were missing last episode, the opening credit scene. We get to hear Howard Shore's new theme for the show for the first time as well. It's kind of similar to how John Williams let other people score the solo film and the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, but created new themes for the main characters. I know the original title reveal sequence back in January was done with practical effects, but I think this one, with all the little pieces of gold moving around and making rings, was done with computers. J.A. Boyan had directed this episode as well as the first. This episode is called Adrift. Not the type of thing you want to put in the audience's mind when they're trying to figure out if the show will end up going somewhere, but it does tie into the events of this episode. Like right at the beginning, as we see Galadriel adrift in the water after jumping off the boat to the Grey Havens. So she starts swimming back the other direction from where the Havens were. That way must be the shore. Back at the meteorite crash site, Nori is looking at the guy in the middle of all the fire. Poppy suddenly shows up and accidentally knocks Nori into the fire. But it turns out it's not hot. Hmm. Fire not being hot. Where have we heard that before? She goes to touch the guy, thinking he's dead, but he reaches out and grabs hold of her. He screams something and the fire goes out. He collapses and it starts up again. Nori wants to bring him back to their village, but Poppy has practical concerns like how do we carry him? Sadak and a couple of the Harfoot women look to see what happened where the meteor crashed. They decide it's better to stay in camp than go out there and investigate. But as they aren't looking, a couple of the lanterns in camp disappear. Nori and Poppy took them in a cart to go get the giant. The girls argue as they try to drag him up a hill, and of course, as they step away to continue arguing, the cart goes down the hill. Yes, it's Nori and Poppy's kooky hijinks today on the Slappy and Wacky Show. Once they try to revive him, they put him in a tent, and Nori insists on staying with him. She knows he's important somehow. And so do we. Arendir and Bronwyn are in the burning city of Hordern. The ground looks like it's been torn apart, but nobody's there. Nobody dead, nobody wounded. They find an underground passage, and the elf figures he has to go down into the dark to figure out what's there. Hey, what could go wrong? We then go with a different set of elves to the city of Eregion, where the elven smiths live. Elrond gets to see the actual hammer that Fenor... See what I mean about the elf F names? There's just so many of them to keep track of the hammer that Fenor made the Silmarils with. They were jewels that contained the light from the two trees we saw last episode. They were so beautiful, even Morgoth almost turned into a good guy. Of course, they also made two groups of elves try to kill each other, so... (sighs) What things they were. Celebrimbor wants to do something that impressive and long-lasting. His idea is to build a giant forge to create the most powerful fire possible. And it has to be done within a few months. Need a lot of people for that. There aren't enough elves, but Elrond knows who might be of some help in building a forge. The two travel to Khazad Dûm, the land of the dwarfs. After an image of stunning waterfalls and picturesque mountainsides, Arundel and Kettleburnborough walk on set by a very nice matte painting of the waterfalls. The downside of 4K TV. Anyway, Elrond is friends with the dwarf prince Durin, and the smithy elf admits he's always admired their work. When they go to the door expecting to be let in, the guard says the wither's not there and they should use the knocker. Now, from a different camera direction, they're clearly outside, so I don't know why they couldn't have both shots with them outside, but I don't know, maybe there was a truck in the background or something. Having not gotten the welcome he was expecting, Elrond invokes the right of Sigin Tarag, Uh, Don't bother looking it up. They just made it up for the show. Whatever it is, it gets the door to open, but Elrond has to do whatever that is alone. The elf is taken through the inner world of the Dwarf Kingdom, through all kinds of bridges and mines and all that. In the inner chamber, Prince Durin arrives. It seems the right is some kind of endurance test where they have to beat rocks up until someone gives up. The other dwarves cheer them on, 
When did the doors become like Klingons? With a blow from a ram's horn, the contest is on. We cut back outside to Nori looking for the giant. He's not where she left him. He's out, in the words of John Mayall, crawling up a hill. He's also making marks on the rocks along the way. When Nori says hello, the giant gets up and screams so loud, the trees begin to break under the pressure. She reminds him she helped him last night, and somehow that gets him to calm down. She gets him to agree that they don't hurt each other and signify it with a couple of Carol Burnett ear tucks. She tries to get him to say her name and tell her his, but it doesn't really get very far. She offers him a snail to eat, which he does, shell and all. Back in the village, Nori's father is fixing something and needs her help. While he tries to lift the pole, the giant makes a sort of familiar-looking mark on the ground, and as the stick he's using breaks, so does Nori's father's leg. All the time, he's screaming, Mana Yure! Hmm. Poppy gets Nori and brings her back to camp to tender her father. It's bad enough that he'll not likely be able to migrate, whatever that is in this case. Out in the water, Galadriel is still swimming when she comes upon the remains of a wrecked ship with people still on board. They argue among themselves whether to let her on. It's big enough, it's not like the size of a door or something, but do they have enough rations? One of the men asks what she's doing out there and realizes she doesn't know about it, namely the worm. One of the other guys pulls back her hair to reveal her pointy ears. For some reason, her being an elf changes the whole situation. Don't ask me how. Before they can continue attacking her, a sail appears out in the fog. It turns out to be a familiar ship, the very one they were shipwrecked off, stuck on the back of a sea monster. I knew there were dragons and other weird things in Middle Earth, but I don't remember ever hearing about sea monsters. One of the women shoves Galadriel off like she's to blame for it finding them. The sea monster then completely wrecks what's left of the raft and chases after the elf. The creature disappears into the fog. A few moments later, what's left of the raft comes out of the fog, being rowed by the only survivor. The man, Halbrand, funny, we know his name, but not her brother or the king's yet. Halbrand lets her come aboard, and they sail towards you know, wherever. Back to the John Henry rock smashing contest, Elf and Dwarf are matching each other stroke for stroke until Elrond's hammer breaks and he can't continue. Durin tells him to leave, but the Elves ask him to escort him out. On the way out, Elrond tries to get the prince to tell him why he's upset. He hadn't been there in 20 years with just a moment for an Elf, but to Dwarves, it's quite a long time. Durin has gotten married and had two children in that space. Elrond apologizes and asks to apologize to his family as well. Durin's wife, Disa, no beard, this seems to be a problem with some people. Disa is the exact opposite, welcoming the elf with open arms and begging him to stay for dinner. After a bit of cajoling, the prince has Elrond tell him about the proposal. Out on the sea, Halbrand tells Galadriel he was forced to flee his homeland by orcs, the same orcs that weren't supposed to be around anymore. He has a necklace which bears the sign of his people, but every time Galadriel tries to find out what land it is, he balks. After telling him she's chased orcs down for several lifetimes, he tells her he's from the Southlands. In those very same Southlands, Bronwyn returns to her home. She tries to convince the people at the tavern they have to leave, but they aren't convinced. Back at her house, Theo is staring into the fire when he hears something scraping underneath the floorboards. He beats it with a fireplace poker so hard he makes a hole. Suddenly an eye pops up there. Turns out it's not a mouse. Arendir is still heading down his tunnel to see what he could find. There are claw marks on the side of the wall along with a leftover claw. He hears rocks falling in front of him and behind. He races up the cave as it narrows down to just a crack. He drops the lantern down an incline to hear it drop into the water. He dives in and swims to another opening. But without a lantern, he can't tell there's something right behind him that pulls him into the darkness. Bronwyn races back to her house to find it in a shambles and a huge hole in the middle of the floor. She calls for Theo, who's hiding in the side closet. She closes up the windows, but then realizes whatever it is is not outside, but inside. A clawed hand reaches out of the hole and an orc emerges. But he's got a goofy animal skull thing on his head, kind of like the one that motorcycle guy wore in City Limits 
or Bugs Bunny had in that one with the fat Elmer Fudd in the desert. The orc finds Theo, who stabs him with a poker. Bronwyn comes out of her hiding place and throws one of her potions on him. The orc loses the skull right as Theo throws a rope around his neck and hangs it up long enough for Bronwyn to get a sword and cut its head off. She brings the head to the tavern, hoping that will convince them there's trouble. Back out at sea, a storm is wreaking havoc on the raft. As they try to lash themselves to it, a bolt of lightning locks Galadriel into the water. Halbrand notices the rope quickly dropping into the water and realizes she's on the other end of it. He dives down and using Finrod's sword, even though they don't say that's what it is, he's able to cut her loose and bring her back to the surface. Elsewhere, Nori and Poppy go to visit the giant to tell him they're leaving. Poppy's firefly lantern starts shaking. She drops it and it breaks, freeing the lightning bugs to fly around the stranger. It looks like he tries to talk to them. They float up and makes what looks like a constellation and Nori realizes they're supposed to be stars. Then suddenly all the fireflies drop dead. Back in Casa Doom, Durin is speaking with his father about how he trusts Elrond, but the king is more suspicious. He's hiding something away and reveals it to his son. The way he opens it, it looks like he's got Marcellus Wallace's suitcase in there. But instead, I think it's something we've already seen in the other uh, pictures. Meanwhile, the men begin to free the village. Theo's packing and he still has the broken sword. Some blood trickles down his arm and touches the sword, which starts to light up and repair itself. He leaves the house and the people leave town. Out at sea, Galadriel wakes up to find a ship is there and someone is staring down right in front of them. Now, I made the comment that at the beginning it's probably never a good idea to name an episode Drift. While it's not completely unmoored, this one didn't really move the plot forward too much with the exception of bringing the dwarves into play. I'm guessing by the preview for next episode, we'll finally get to Numenor. We'll have to see at the end of the season if that part of the story should have been brought up sooner and how exactly they're going to compress the history. In this episode, the main point of contention with the Tolkien experts is the fact that both the King of the Dwarves and the Prince were both named Durin. Now, in the books, Durin III was the king when the Rings of Power were forged. But there was a little bit in there that any king named Durin was a reincarnation of the first Durin. To be a reincarnation, the current incarnation can't still be around. So while it's not specifically in any of the books they can use, they probably should have opted for another name for the prince. They could have used any of the other ones we know, like Thorin or Dane or anything else. One thing I won't get on the showrunner's case about is not having female dwarves having beards. I mean, it's just distracting, let's be honest. The other odd thing about this episode was a lot of it was inspired less by J.R.R. Tolkien than by H.P. Lovecraft or some of the other writers who dealt with the dark worlds like Clark Ashton Smith. Sea monsters really didn't have a part in Middle-earth lore, not that I could find easily anyway, and a battle with the orc was something straight out of Evil Dead. I was half expecting Bruce Campbell to hop out of the hole and chop the orc in half with his chainsaw. So in this episode, the main Tolkien part is Elrond and Celebrimbor getting ready to forge the rings and getting the name of the Dwarf King at the time correct. We're also not quite sure exactly who the giant stranger is, but we've got a good idea who he's related to. They're also setting up for the kings of men to end up being corrupted by the rings and becoming the Nazgul. That's probably not going to happen until late season four and possibly early season five, depending on exactly when the rings show up. I think they should probably hold off on the rings themselves till next season. Just deal with the concept in these first eight episodes. Whew, wow. I did three episodes in the space of a week. How did I get that done? Going forward, we'll be settling into a more, more normal weekly schedule for the next six episodes, then ratchet back to bi-weekly or even monthly, depending on what's going on out there to write about. I know for sure we'll do an episode on the fall of Numenor in November, and for December, we'll switch gears a little bit, as this year is the 90th anniversary of a gentleman known as Conan the Barbarian. So, a bunch of other things to look forward to coming up soon.
As I mentioned, it looks like we'll finally get to Numenor next episode and find out if the figure at the end of this episode is Elendil. We'll get to see some more orcs and supposedly see female orcs in the series if that floats your boat. And we'll see if we get to find out exactly who the stranger is. Or is it? You'll find us on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, as well as the occasional Valleys of Numenor channel on YouTube. Just one video there now. We'll try to add some more along the way. I'm John Archer. Thanks for listening.